Joining me now on set is Peter Baker, chief White House correspondent for The New York Times, MSNBC political analyst, and was stationed in Moscow for a bit. Dan Yale Pletka, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, MSNBC contributor, and Eugene Robinson, Washington Post columnist and also an MSNBC contributor. Peter Baker, it's hard to not say, geez, had any other former president backseat driven this with, I mean, you know, I know we're so numb to this now with him and all this stuff, but my gosh, yeah. the world is about to confront maybe somebody who's a madman right now. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what the former president is doing? To sum up, the former president had critical words of Biden, okay, had critical words of Democrats, had no critical words of Vladimir Putin. He bragged that it wouldn't have happened on his watch, but he used words like savvy, genius, smart. And it's just, it's, it's, it boggles the imagination at a time like this when you would have that. Yeah, he, uh, yes, we shouldn't be surprised. He showed admiration and right. affection for Putin all along. But in this moment, when tanks are literally rolling across the border, to be praising uh, Vladimir Putin as a genius is pretty shocking. Danny, I, I don't, I mean, it is creating a new wing of the Republican Party. Well, you the know, pro-Putin wing. Look, first of all, I know it's super tempting to talk about Donald Trump because it's so great to talk about Donald <laughs> no, Trump. No, it's not tempting. We it's, Donald this Trump is so a much. former. But we're in the middle of this nonsense. Yes, and he's doing but, this. but Joe Biden is actually the president yeah. of the United States, and. I actually would prefer to focus on the fact that this administration actually didn't do enough to prevent this, didn't present a very tough front when Putin made clear what he was about to do. And I think it's also important to understand that the Democrats are as divided, if not more divided, than the Republicans on what actually to do. We just saw a big group of sort of Rand Paulites and squad types and Trumpians in the House send a letter to President Biden saying, we don't we want you to notify Congress before you send any troops to Ukraine. I'm sorry. Who talked about sending troops to Ukraine? Nobody what kind of a dumb letter is that? Yet you've brought isolationist Republicans and isolationist Democrats together. And I would say that the isolationist Democrats are much mm -hmm. more important in their party than the isolationist Republicans. Oh, I would disagree completely with that. That's <laughs> 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 simply not true. Yeah, the isolationist uh, Republicans are listening to the most powerful person in the Republican Party, Donald Trump, uh, they don't want to incur his wrath. They see he touched a, an isolationist nerve out there. Uh, and, and I think this is, this is enormously consequential. The isolationist Democrats have no leader, have no constituency. I'm sorry. Hang on a really? second. C can we continue this? Go please? for it. <laughs> I, look, what do we call I, that? I understand, again, that, that we'd like to Michael. think that the former yeah. president is more important than Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy. But, in fact, those are the ones with political power right now. Absolutely. And, and I would say that there is a reason that we have not seen stronger legislation brought to the House floor, and that is because the White House and Nancy Pelosi have agreed that they don't want to do it. The reason Ted Cruz has praised the president is because he has been holding up nominees. Europeans for have months. nothing to do with Hang this. Hang on a second. Europeans <laughs> had a lot to do with had this. Had a lot did they to not? do with what? Uh, getting us as. At the end of the day, we could only do as much as the Europeans were willing to do to make it I'm effective. Sorry. What? Hang on. Who's when, in when charge I, of European security? When, when has that ever been the lead on American foreign policy? We can't well, do it because the Europeans Europe? won't do it? Come it, on. Not if it's not effective. The Europeans are weak need on we Russia. Can't they're pull weak need on Stream. Iran. No, no, but we couldn't pull Nord Stream until Germany was willing to. Exactly. And of course we could have imposed sanctions on Nord Stream. Germany was always standing in the way, and we could have imposed those sanctions and made it impossible to go uh, forward. Here's the here's well, problem. They've now canceled Nord Stream, and it hasn't stopped Putin. Of course it's not. So they could have done it Well, today. this is the other thing. What I don't understand is I understand. <laughs> and the, the criticism. Biden hasn't done enough. Well, the only un, the only thing next is either wiping Russia off the economic banking system, or yeah. or troops. That's what right. more? What more is there to do? Here's the problem on, on, on for, for Biden, and, and we can argue whether he's done enough or not. But if Putin's goal here is to rewrite history, if his goal here after 23 years in power is to go down in history, his own legacy as somebody reassembling the Russian Empire, that's a kind of me, uh, you know messianic goal that's not affected by diplomacy or deterrence. He's already factored in 
sanctions. He's already figured out. I believe out we call people like them madmen. Well, I mean, I mean, it's a megalomaniac. He, no, 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 no. But that's no, a I megalomaniac. Know, I know, I know. Right? He's, he's a already, megalomaniac. He has already taken into account everything that he knows we're going to do and that we have said yeah. we're going to do and that we are likely to do. And he's well, already made his calculation that he's willing to live with that trade off. That's a hard thing for an outsider to influence. Well, I don't think sanctions stops that. I mean, no, I, that's, I, the, no, that's, no, the that's, that's the problem. That's the problem. Don't stop Peter, that doesn't mean it's wrong to do it. I'm just saying that it's really But I just don't know if sanctions will stop I have a question for Peter because you lived in Moscow. One of the things that that our analysts at AI say about Putin is that a lot of what he's done uh, regionally has been with a view internally because he has problems internally. Sanctions can make his life very unpleasant internally, real biting sanctions of the kind we had, used to have on Iran. They can divorce Russia Absolutely. from the international financial system. Yeah. They can actually take money away from all of his cronies and maybe even from him. Yeah. Do you think that might have any effect? Well, here's the thing. He already knows that. Yeah. And he's already factored that into decision. So it may be a mistake on his part. He may be uh, making a miscalculation in which he will pay a price because once these sanctions do go on, if they were to actually have a full-scale invasion, they will pay a price that will rebound against him. But he knows that already and has decided he doesn't care. And they've had months to get ready for him, basically. In terms of hiding their money, in terms of pulling it back, all these things that we can affect, they know what we can do, they know what our capabilities are, they've decided to shield it. And there is an argument I've seen made that it will actually empower Putin because the rest of Russia society will be weaker because they're not connected to the outside world and he may actually be okay with that i i just that that's the i don't know what look whatever i think biden we can say has a bad hand when you have european allies that are you're dealing with but i don't know what the next move is if well, he wants to move in well i don't Jane. i mean i look i european allies um what, what happened yesterday in the, the sort of coordinated reveal of these sanctions that are complementary that that fit together like well now it's you know it's not going to bring Putin or Russia to its knees uh, but they are significant and getting that to happen uh, I think was was you know a per, but it was an accomplishment it was a pretty big right, ac accomplishment let me ask now, you this why didn't we there's a part of me that says yes that's pretty good but it felt like we had a bigger coalition against Iraq and Kuwait you know what I mean? Like, I, I part of me is disappointed that more of the globe isn't standing by us on this. We had Russia well, against Iraq during that's 1991. Then, that's the big difference. That was 30 years ago. Yeah, that was when things looked good. I mean, the Cold I say this, but it's like we have, we have not and that's rallied. And, and part of it is well, I think everybody's insular right now because of COVID. Everybody's right? insular. That has to it. be a next step. But if you, you know, if you paid attention to the Security Council meeting, you know, Kenya, uh, chair of that meeting opened with a, a with a powerful, powerful uh, anti-Putin speech, yeah. defending sovereignty and democracy, and every, I mean it was really powerful. So it's out there, and that should be a next step, I think. Yeah, to see more around the world. What do you think, Dan? The, the Europeans have always been weak on these issues. Look at what happened in the Balkans. It was. We. It was war on their territory, and yes. we had to go in we, under the Clinton administration and pull their bacon out of the fire. They've not been tough enough on Germany. I mean, <laughs> slip of the tongue. Yeah. Not, been, <laughs> not, <laughs> not been tough enough. A few staff meetings have done the same thing. Sorry, Germany, your history always catches up with you. I know. <laughs> you know. Not been tough enough on Russia. Germany's always been in the forefront. Yeah. They're, and they are fundamentally mercantilist about their about yeah. their problems. Peter, they really yeah. are. Well, let's talk about Ukraine but, here a minute. I, let's go to Ukraine. Go ahead. No, I, I, just on that point, though, don't you think that what's happening now has the potential to change minds in terms of that mercantilism that you're talking about when you see Russia, you know, invading a sovereign country? I'd, I'd love to give credit to I'd love to give credit to Joe Biden for having brought together this coalition, but I think it was Vladimir Putin who brought together this coalition more than anything else. We've allowed the situation to get so bad that finally the Europeans are willing to do a little bit. I'd like to see what else they're willing to do. Peter, uh, it feels like the Ukrainians <laughs> are going to fight Putin a lot harder than he expects. Yeah. And this is what is scary is how bloody I think. Are we really going to sit here on the sideline and watch this? It it's is going to be. be. It's it going to be, be bloody. Because it's changed in the last eight years, right? When Putin first goes in in 2014, he takes Crimea, he foments the separatist uprising in the east. That has had an effect in the, on the rest of Ukraine. Even Russian-speaking Ukrainians don't want, at least a lot of them, most of them, don't want their country to suddenly be sucked up into, into Russia again. And I think he has lost a lot of the potential 
favorability that Russia had in Ukraine over these last eight years. You know, I bet my guest on my podcast this week is Bill Taylor, former ambassador UN, and he says he was with a friend who uh, went to a gun store uh, in U in Kiev, and it was lines. It was just a ton of lines. He yeah. says Ukrainians are more patriotic than ever, and they're ready to fight. Yeah, it, it's. I don't know if Putin realizes what he's bargained for here. Danny and Eugene, always. always, always <laughs> that's what we want. That's why it's great to be in person. This is what political debate is about. Peter Pitzer, thank you.